Devron today with uh, Oliver's talk about uh, challenges in modern visualization. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm Oliver, and uh, as you said, I will talk a bit about the new challenges uh, that's in fact already existing, but are, are also coming in the virtualization world. So uh, first, um, I'm uh, the CEO of a uh, company doing open source software in virtualization things in general. I'm a former system administrator. Uh, I'm using Zen since a while now, so I'm more Zen guy. Um, I created the project called Zen Orchestra, which is a uh, backup management solution for initially Zen Server and then XCPNG, which is also a project I started as a fork of Zen Server. And as I said earlier, uh, this project is now hosted inside uh, the Linux Foundation, thanks uh, to Lars. Um, if you want to have access to some details of the presentation, then it's available on this link. So sometimes I won't go in some deep details, and if you want to, to learn more, you will be able to take a look at those links. So um, I'm not someone really uh, deeply technical, so I'm not a kernel hacker or Zen hacker, but I'm more, as I said, from the user side of virtualization. So the thing is, as my position of you know, uh, selling support for uh, open source solution, I'm a lot on the field, uh, it could be at this kind of conferences, but also uh, meeting with uh, developers or people who might actually decide to take this or that solution. So this gave me a way to, I think, uh, feel a bit uh, what's going on in this world. So that's a non-technical talk, but more an overview on what's going on. And uh, a funny thing I, I hear a lot uh, on the field is that people seem to forget that virtualization is almost uh, everywhere because people said, I would say people's more exec in general, but anyway, people said, I'm reading or seeing a lot of stuff about, uh, you know, with the trend of going everything to the cloud using orchestration, whatever, and without even noticing it, they are very likely using, not them directly, but the thing that they are using are on top of virtualization. So I think it's somehow a good sign that uh, it's pretty everywhere and even now in places that we didn't suspect maybe a few years ago. But against that, it means that there is new challenges that will come with this position of virtualization. So those challenges are, uh, I mean, three main topics. Uh, the big one is obviously security. Uh, I think you might know why. Um, about the performances and finally about all the new use cases. So what about security? Uh, when I use the word we, uh, I'm not talking about, you know, very technical people or people aware or security researchers, but the, the you know, the average admin or uh, the average exec, maybe. Uh, the trend that we all uh, saw is coming from the layer one, the hardware, and then adding more and more layers on top. So, I mean, there is uh, an explanation because it's easier for people to do some stuff uh, because you will have more abstraction. But the thing is, by going more and more on top, then you tend to forget what's going on on the bottom. So for example, I started with virtualization, then a public cloud, then orchestration, containers, containers orchestration, serverless. Uh, but it seems that somehow your code has to run on some hardware somewhere in the end. And even developerless. So uh, this is a thing uh, on Twitter, if you click on the link. Uh, there's some people that can imagine that you can get rid of all the developers forever and just in a few clicks create a, a great application that scales, etc., etc. So in the head of a lot of people, uh, we are going far away from the metal. And in the meantime, another phenomenon is happening, and you probably know that, that uh, in the hardware, there is more and more software somehow. So it's like car manufacturers, you know? Uh, in your modern car, you have tons of software that you didn't have maybe 20 years ago. And it means that companies focusing on hardware are delivering more and more software. And somehow those teams working on those features on the hardware, uh, doing this low-level software, aren't really sometimes have not really priorities about security. So we will see with an example later. 
So in short, uh, we, again, uh, not especially you, but <laughs> we thought that our hardware was secure. We thought that when you purchase something uh, from Dell, HP, whatever, then it's something that you just put in your infrastructure and you don't touch it and you will add all your layers on top. But if you do that nowadays, uh, you will forget about the foundations. The foundation is the layer one and what's going on if you have weak foundations and have a lot of stacks on top of that? Well, the result is not great. Uh, if, as you can see here, this is exactly the same uh, metaphor. It's you have weak foundation and all the layers on top are going down because if you are uh, be able to hack on the low level, then you can get everything what you have on top. So what about those problems on the hardware? Well, I think you know them right in the silicon. Uh, you have all the uh, issues with those uh, at least Intel CPUs, but also some others. But the, the biggest impact was on Intel stuff. So I want details. I think you know some of them. And if you don't, uh, Google them. Uh, so this is right in the silicon. I insist because uh, it means that uh, it won't be able to, to change tomorrow. What about BMCs? So BMCs, if you don't know the, the word exactly, that's your ILO IDRAC, your uh, extra small CPU and network card on your motherboard that's allowing you to do very cool stuff in the data center so you can install, you know, an ISO remotely, uh, update your firmware, or cycle the, the machine, so that's great. But in the last 10 years, we had a, a huge amount of CVEs uh, on security flows in those hardware. And this is, uh, again, from the hardware at this lower level, you can access to a ton of stuff, even if your top layers are secure. So we learned that even your hardware, what you think is purely hardware, must be updated often, like you do for your operating system, like you do for uh, your application, etc., etc. You might also uh, decide to disable some features on your CPUs, for example, hyperthreadings to be secure against some side channel attacks. Um, and again, I, I repeat that because it's really important. The, the security should be considered as a whole. So if you have a problem on one state and lower is the layer when you have the security issue, bigger the impact will be. Those side channel attacks and hardware bugs are here to stay. By that, I mean that you won't change all your hardware tomorrow. But even if you can do that, I'm pretty sure that we'll continue to find some flaws in the current uh, silicon designs for a lot of reasons. One of them, for example, is that uh, x86 is very complicated. And then uh, uh, we could continue, researchers will continue to, to find new issues. So it, it will stay. The problem won't vanish tomorrow. So, OK, so I talk a bit about uh, some general stuff. But what about the impact uh, of everything, like I said, on virtualization? So um, funnily enough, uh, the first answer might be not especially on the technical side, but you need first, because you know that you will have some new flaws coming, you need to have a great security workflow for your project. So for example, uh, for the Zen project, there is a really great security process. So uh, if you want to see uh, uh, what it is exactly, basically it's somehow a flow chart or a checklist or at least a process that will guide you then if you tomorrow you got a big problem then you will go how to handle this in the project so the first answer might be just uh, a way to organize the project to react to these problems also something that's uh, uh, really important is to have a good design documentation so how your hypervisor is working how it works uh, and because if you have a great design documentation I mean not going in the full details, it means that people from outside, for example, security researchers, can tell you, OK, I'm not inside the authorization, but I'm in CPU security. And I see that uh, through your design documentation that you could probably mitigate this or that uh, uh, by just removing this or adding that. So that's why it's more important than ever to have a clear explanation of how it works. And obviously, the usual community stuff that we know in open source. But for hypervisor, it means, uh, for example, a great um, communication between different projects, for example, KVM and Zen, because more brains means more ways to tackle issues. And even if there is some design differences, uh, there is some influence on how to, to work on a problem uh, and how to, to solve it. Uh, 
So for example, uh, I have in mind this core scheduling, which is a very interesting thing that have been, you know, uh, thought by people in the kernel, in KVM, and also in Zen, and mixing ideas is always great. And external people, uh, so it goes back to the good design documentation, so you have more easily people on board telling you what's, what's wrong on your, on your solution. So regarding uh, the technical solution, uh, the first one is because it's more and more complex and there is more and more flows, uh, you need to modularize the code. So it means that you let uh, the user deciding to use some parts of the code or notes, so it can be mitigations, but it could be also features of the hypervisor. So people we use, for example, strip version of, uh, in this case, Zen for OpenXT, which is a, a project used in, you know, uh, defense sector because it's the, the attack surface is really lower than the full feature thing. So the other issue with that, if, if you gave a lot of choice to users, then you have to guide them to, to tell them if you want uh, a security, then you might choose this or that, and if you don't care, then you can use all the features, etc. Also, we saw that updating the low-level software is pretty important, and to do that, uh, you must have ways to, to do it uh, in a way that won't disrupt your everyday operation. So we know that if it's hard to update, that people won't update. So giving you a few examples, so applying microcode to your CPU without doing a reboot, it's called uh, uh, late microcode loading Zen. That's really interesting to avoid any production disruption. Uh, live patching, live upgrade, I think it's called live update by uh, IW, AWS people that contributed to Zen, allowing to uh, um, make a major upgrade of Zen version in live without, on a, on a physical machine without having to uh, uh, even to reboot or uh, disrupt the VM. So that's really interesting. Uh, if, you are, if you want to get the details, you can uh, click on the link. And on the technical solution, I will be brief, but in short, you probably heard some of them. So the, the goal is to have a better isolation and to avoid all side channels attack. So there is a lot of strategy. It's a non-exhaustive list. Uh, there's a lot of different approach, but uh, we have a lot of ideas on how to improve that. So what about the performances? And there is a link between the security and performances, and the link is you must continue to work on the perf side if you uh, are also working on security, because if you forget about performances and doing you know, more and more mitigation, then you will have a problem, because uh, uh, there is always you know, a balance on security and performances. Sometimes you can have both, but it's not the usual case. Um, uh, I think uh, what I, I didn't write it, but the, the idea also is to have benchmark tools to be sure that, for example, with a, with a CI platform, to be sure that your modification won't ruin all the performances of your hypervisor. Uh, on the compute side, uh, as you may know, CPUs are bigger and bigger, uh, at least in the uh, x86 world, so you also must have to uh, maybe rethink some parts of the code because you need to uh, adapt to the massive number of cores that are existing right now in the CPUs. Uh, on the storage side, well, it's not a new trend per se, but in the end, we have cheaper NVMe drives and some storage stack have been made when we only had HDDs. So <clears throat> they are wearing bottlenecks, but now, for example, an NVMe drive uh, uh, is able to wait because the CPU is too busy uh, to, to write stuff on it. So you have to think uh, on the way to, to write on your disk uh, without making syscalls, uh, using modern libraries like IO Uring, etc. But it's also something that you need to do carefully because it's always the balance between isolation and performances. So again, uh, benchmark when you make some modification there. About new use cases, um, it's pretty funny because uh, for some of them, I didn't saw them coming. So for example, the embed world, uh, people in the embed world really love virtualization because it allows to make isolation on software level. Uh, so it might be cheaper in some cases, but the challenge by doing that for uh, a, a project, like for example, the Zen project, is the compliance because you need to have you know, standards of security standards, especially inside the IR space or automotive projects. So you need to have a kind of framework to validate or to have, uh, you know, be compliant with the standards without disrupting the way you are uh, building software every day. Again, finding the right balance. Uh, you have new architectures, and I think that's really interesting because there's 
a lot of great things to get from there. So RIX-5, for example, uh, there's a lot of talks uh, about it. And I think having, for example, porting Zen to it uh, might be really something uh, great in the future. Uh, we saw also more ARM um, deployments in the server world. And I think, uh, I personally think that would have been a thing maybe, you know, eight years ago, something like that, but it didn't. But maybe this time it will be a bit different because uh, the, the performance level is, uh, is pretty great. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, I think, that's my opinion by seeing everything, that uh, um, virtualization will see more uh, challenge than ever because everything is more complicated, especially in the server world and in the x86 world. And we have to take into account uh, the security that isn't maybe great on some hardware, uh, on the VMCs. So all the physical layers should be, uh, you know, um, be able to be updated quickly without disrupting everything. So as the, the layer just on top of that, there is some uh, heavy responsibilities to do that something that just works because otherwise the overhead uh, won't be contained. And virtualization is a great tool because that's really flexible. You can do a lot of uh, uh, great stuff with it, like, you know, migrate or have your hardware abstraction, isolation, etc., etc. But it will stay relevant as long as the work is done to avoid all the issues on the layer on the bottom. Uh, and this, uh, this work, which is, I think, more and more important and, and huge nowadays, because, as I said, there is porting to a new architecture, uh, all the security work, etc., that will need uh, uh, more bigger collaborations between security researchers or uh, benchmark people, multiple open source projects, uh, and uh, I think this is, in the open source world, the, the challenge is to have everyone on board to find solutions together because uh, one project on one side won't be able to, to keep up alone. So it's all um, a way to continue to nurture those communities to work together. That's really important. But uh, uh, the reward to do that is pretty high because it means that uh, if we can do that, if we can keep up the pace, but if we can also work with people at the limits on the hardware and software, we could, you know, not only uh, use virtualization in new use cases, but also maybe bring a lot of innovation that uh, will help virtualization to, to, thri to thrive in this world. So uh, there is a lot of opportunities on those current uh, KVM and Zen projects. And I think we will see more and more stuff coming and the limit on the hardware and software. Because in the last six months or so, I saw more and more companies created working on very low level things like CPUs, architecture, or even building x86 servers. So people that aren't Dell or HPE, etc. You know, there is somehow, uh, uh, some people want to disrupt a bit this world. So, I have the feeling that it will continue and then we should take a look at that because if we've been there uh, pretty early in this stage of research, we can, it can lead to really interesting things. Um, I'm done. So, thank you. So if you have questions, go ahead. So that was pretty clear. <laughs>